السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین وعلی آلہ واصحابہ اجمعین ویلکم ٹو اور ویکلی اکنا آئی لاف قرآن ویبینار سیریز ام دس ویک انشاءاللہ ویل بی کنٹینیوئنگ دی تھیم اف آخرا دیٹ ویو بین ڈسکسنگ ان دی لاسٹ فیو سیشنز Uh, today's webinar will be delivered by Sheikh Abdul Rahman Khan and the verses that we will be studying are from Surah Kaf verses 19 to 35. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi amma ba'd dear brothers all assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and also dear sisters uh, Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, inshallah, today we are going to look at the verses in Surah Qaf 19 to 35. And we have about 25 minutes or so to look at these verses. <clears throat> um, they are very much in depth uh, concept. And so basically we are going to be looking at believe in ghaib, reality and the agonies of death, trumpet, the qareen, the companion and the argumentation, the deeds that take people to hellfire, the conversation with hellfire, the muttaqoon and paradise and what deeds take to paradise. So all of these are captured in these verses. In fact, one of them will take uh, a whole you know, hour or two to talk about, but we have to be concise and you will have to read between the lines. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim wa jaa'at sakratu al-mawti bil-haqq thalika ma kunta minhu tahid that the agonies of death will come in truth. This is what you have been avoiding. So people uh, are avoiding this moment of death but it is going to come and we have seen uh, that this is the reality of all those who Allah has given life to all of what we are going to be talking about today is about ghaib it is the iman bil ghaib none of these things are physical um, or so manifest that people can come back and tell us, you know, when I'm going through death, this is what is happening. So we have to believe in the ghaib with all what is going to be discussed today. Um, in terms of sakratul maut, this is the moment of the agonies or the throes of death, which happens. Sometimes it is the rattling of the throat. or it is that phase of exiting out from this dunya into the akhirah. No one knows when that time will happen, but it will happen. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, in Allah indahu ilmu sa'a wa yunazzilu al-ghayth wa ya'lamu ma fil arham wa ma tadri nafsun ma tha taqsibu ghada wa ma tadri nafsun bi ayyi ardin tamut in Allah alim al-khabir that verily Allah, with him alone is the knowledge of the hour. He sends down the rain and knows that which is in the wombs. No person knows what he will earn tomorrow and no person knows in what land he will die. Verily Allah is all knower, all aware of things. So we don't know when and where we are going to die. And this is the Uh, beauty of preparing for that moment. Muslim narrated, and the, you know, Muslim, Jabir said, I heard the Prophet وسلم, says three days before he died, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن بالله الظن. And this is important that no one of you should die except thinking positively of Allah. No matter what sickness, no matter what hardship, no matter what difficulty you may go through, um, but in the end, 
you must know that Allah is all wise, all powerful, all merciful, all kind. You cannot give up on the hope in Allah and think of Allah, of any uh, question him why this is happening to you. Now, you may want, want to ask, well, how come um, people will die all over the world? In fact, people, thousands of people die in the same moment. Moment means a split second. And that could be simultaneous around the globe. Somebody dies in China, somebody dies in North America, in South America, in Australia, and all of these. What we have to understand is that the world of ghaib do not follow the law of this earthly world in which we are in, the law of time and space. And so we cannot think of how is it happening, but we do believe in ghaib, that Allah has the power, that all of these things are happening at the same time in the same manner, whether somebody dies uh, years of sickness or somebody dies instantaneously, they all go through this process of sacratal mouth. And this sacratal mouth, Imam Bukhari narrated that Aisha radiallahu anha during the sickness in which Prophet ﷺ died, that the Prophet ﷺ put his hand in water and wiped his face saying, La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti sakarat. So when the Prophet ﷺ was about to leave this world, he asked for a container of water and he would take that water and wipe his face and say, La ilaha illallah, verily death has agonies. And he held up his hand and started saying, with the higher companion until he passed away and his hand fell. Um, this was the very vivid description at the time of the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. What is important here is that he tells us in the little Mauti Sakarat that death has its agonies. Not that he felt pain, but he is a messenger of Allah and he has to describe uh, that moment for us in his own experience. As for death of a shaheed, Abu Huraira radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet said, "La yajidu shahidu min masil qatl illa kama yajidu ahadukum masil qarsa." That the martyr, the shaheed, does not feel anything more when he is killed than the one of you feel if he's pinched. Okay, so you might see a shaheed, the person in the path of Allah dies. You might see his body torn apart and you might think he went through that suffering. In fact, um, that moment, what he feels is just like a little pinch that you will feel, any one of you will feel. This hadith is um, related by a number of the Ashab Sunan. Now, then verse 19 uh, is also telling us that those who have been avoiding death and denying, you know, or forgetting about that, this is what you have been avoiding. You know, sometimes we also have a feeling that when somebody, oh, don't talk about death, don't talk about death, this is a culture that is other than Islamic culture. Islamic culture is that you think about that. And we cannot, we cannot um, uh, think that if I talk about death, I'm going to die. I will not breathe a, a single moment or more or less than what Allah SWT has decreed. So, you know, sometimes people try to avoid talking about death. Whereas death is something good to remind yourself and to talk about. So Allah says, This is what you have been avoiding. This is the end 
that you were trying to avoid, trying to escape, now it has come to you. Therefore, you will have to leave. You will have neither a shelter, nor a refuge, nor a sanctuary, nor asylum from this. There is no escape now. You can be in very secure towers where you kept yourself in this world protected from people. But when the moment of death comes and the angel comes to take your life, no building will be secure. As I said, the ghaib, there is no, not the same like us, the time and space, an ability to reach that person. So what should you do when death is near or if you know someone whom death is near? Um, the first thing is to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially, it's a constant reminder that we should always think of repenting to Allah uh, on a daily basis. If you know that, you know, death is not too long, you have a terminal illness, um, ask people for their forgiveness. If you have somebody's property taken unjustly, return it to them. Constant zikr and recitation of the Quran. These are things that you do. Then the next verse is telling us about the trumpet is, is blown. وَنُفِقَ فِي السُّورِ ذَلِكَ يَوْمُ الْوَعِيدِ وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقٌ وَشَهِيدٌ Then the trumpet will be blown. That will be the day whereof warning has been given. Okay, this is the day of resurrection. Warning has been given. This is a promised day. And وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقٌ وَشَهِيدٌ And every person will come forth along with a sa'iq, a driver, that person driving him, and to that plane or to the plane where they have to now go and meet on that gathering, and a shaheed and an angel that bear witness. So the sa'iq is an angel who drives the individual to Allah and the shaheed is the one who witnesses the deeds. And it could be the angels, it could be some interpretation, could be the hand, the feet, of anything that witnesses of the person. Yahya bin Rafi, the free servant of Thaqif, said he heard Uthman ibn Affan and giving a speech in which he recited, وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِكٌ وَشَهِيدٌ And he said, every person will come forth along with a saik and a shaheed. And then he said, a saik is to drive the person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a shaheed is to witness against him what he has done. And we are going to have more people or more angels and more other companions as we are moving along into the akhirah. So these are the first two that once the trumpet is blown, there are two for every person here. So just a little visual of what driving that person might be in terms of a little visual expression. Now the disbelievers and their action regarding this day. And this is verses 22 to 26. 22 to 26 tells us about the disbelievers. لَقَدْ كُنْتَ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٍ وَقَالَ قَرِينُهُ هَذَا مَا لَدَيَّ عَتِيدٍ أَلْقِيَا فِي جَهَنَّمَ كُلَّ كَفَّارٍ عَنِيدٍ مَنْ نَاعِلْ لِلْخَيْرِ مُعْتَدٍ مُرِيبٍ أَلَّذِي جَعَلَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر now, this is a very loaded set of verses. We have, as I said, we have to, we are moving through a little quickly because we want to have a general uh, understanding. It will be said to the sinners, indeed, you were heedless of this. Now we have removed your covering. And sharp is your side this day, meaning that all the covering of 
disbelief and, and negligence and, and total disregard of what you have you know been told about qiyam and now you're seeing the reality so this this covering that you place on your eyes now you're seeing the reality and the companion angel will say here is a record ready with me and it will be said to them both the saik and the shaheed both of you throw into hell every stubborn disbeliever manna hinderer of good transgressor doubter who set up another ilah with allah then both of you cast him in the severe torment subhanallah 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 may allah save us from that so what is their action what is the action of those who goes through this uh punishment here first they were heedless or careless of the hereafter you know no thoughts of the hereafter no concept of the hereafter no seriousness of the hereafter two they were stubborn disbeliever they were told over and over but they remained in stubbornness out of their arrogance out of their pride that they do not want to believe in the one god hinderer of good so they are themselves not doer of good and they stop people from doing good stop people from praying stop people breaking long massage doing all of these things you know banning people from doing good work transgressor that is going beyond their limits what they were told to do they go beyond that doubter that everything you say to them is doubting set up another ilah with allah and by the way ilah here does not necessarily mean just an idol it can be anything that you surrender to you can surrender to your ego to the point that your ego becomes your ilah allah tells us in surah furqan have you not seen people who have taken their desires as their ilah so here your ilah can be anything that you surrender and succumb to what are the consequences of people who do these things they can now see and hear clearly what they blinded themselves in this dunya they are thrown into the fire of hell which will have a severe torment now why are they why is it that they see clearly now for a believer he sees these believes these things in so full reality like ali radiallahu an used to say that you know we so believe in the hereafter we so believe in the ghaib that if the hereafter came to us like all of these things it would not have increased us in more certainty than what we are already certain about it i mean we have to reach that level of certainty and this is what will clear our vision and clear our ear and clear our heart and, and make us perceive Allah, worship Allah, follow his commandments. But if we are blinded by our egos and desires and, and all of these things that take us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the day all these things will now be taken away and the person will find themselves you know whatever they blinded themselves with this is what now the reality is so it is good that we are going through this dars and rem reminder of the akhirah but it is better that in our own moments before we sleep or if we wake up at night uh, brothers think of the akhirah just think of the moment when the angel of death comes to you until it is either, either to Jannah, which I hope and pray we all get into, or Jahannam, which may Allah forgive us and, and save us from that. Okay. Um, then uh, their regrets. What, what will they say? Uh, Allah tells us about their regret. 
not in this ayah, but in chapter 32, رَبَّنَا أَبْصَرْنَا وَسَمِعْنَا فَرَجَعْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا إِلَّا مُكِنُونَ And if you could see when the criminals hung their heads before their Lord, saying, Our Lord, we have now seen and heard, so send us back to the world and we will do the righteous good deeds. Verily, we now believe with certainty. Okay, so you wait till then to see certainty. So this is where the ghaib of a believer really makes a lot of difference. And how much you believe in the ghaib, so much you will be uh, wondering. Now, I always put this belief in ghaib in four scenarios. For a believer, it's always a win-win situation. For a believer, let us say you believe in the unseen and it happens. Then the believer wins everything. Okay, you win. You really are the winner here. Let's say you believe in the unseen and it doesn't happen. And this is just what you call mantik or, or scenarios that put into your mind. What did the believer lose? If I believe that there is akhirah and akhirah never happens, I didn't lose anything. Maybe I didn't drink rum. I didn't drink, eat pork or that, that's it. So I did not really lose anything in this world. For a disbeliever, you do not believe in the unseen. And let's say it does not happen. What did you win? Did you win anything? You did not win anything. It just didn't happen. But the fourth case scenario, you do not believe in the unseen and it happens. For the disbeliever, he loses everything and he's doomed forever. And this time it is way too late. It is way too late. So in all these scenarios, for a believer, it's always a win-win. You haven't lost anything here. Okay, for this one, you didn't win anything if it, it, it ha does not come. But if it happens, and we as believers say it will happen, they are the biggest of losers. Okay, now come the other verses where the man and the devil, each one of us have uh, Karin, which if each one of us have uh, a shaitan with us. And this comes the dispute before Allah. Chapter 20, uh, verses 27 to 29. Qala qarinuhu rabbana ma adghaytuhu wa lakin kana fi dhalalin ba'id. Qala la tahtasimu ladaya wa qad qaddamtu ilaykum bi al-wa'id. Ma yubaddalu al-qawlu ladaya wa ma ana bi dhalami lil-abid. His companions, the evil shaitan that is within that person will say, our... Our Lord, I did not push him to transgress in his disbelief or whatever. But he was himself in error far astray. Allah will say, dispute not in front of me. I have already in advance sent you the threat. But if you, if you do wrong thing, this is what's going to happen. The sentence that comes from me cannot be changed. And I am not unjust to the least, uh, to, to the slaves or to my slaves, okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unjust in any way. People, this is now their own doing. So this qareen here refers to the devil who is entrusted to every man. And the man will say basically, oh Lord, this devil has misguided me away from the remembrance after it came from me. And, you know, the devil will say, no, 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 I did not do that. In another ayah, um, Iblis will say, uh, shaytanu lamma amra inna Allah wa wa al-haq wa wa'abtukum fa'akhlaftukum wa ma kana li alaykum min sultan illa da'awtukum fastajabtum li fala talumuni wa lumu anfusakum ma ana bin masrikhikum wa ma anta min masrikhi Shaitan will say when the matter has been decided. Now, here it is. Verily, Allah promise you a promise of truth. And I too promise you, but I betrayed you. You see where this thing is going? I have no authority over you except I called you and you responded to me. So don't blame me, blame yourselves. I cannot help you, nor you cannot help me. 
I deny your former act in associating me as a partner with Allah. Verily, this there is a painful punishment for the wrongdoers. Okay, so there are several other places where he was saying, you know, I I'm afraid of Allah, so don't even think. Yes, I did, I did whisper, but you did it yourself. So here it is, all the whispering of Shaitan that is coming to us that sounds good. This is what the end will be. And Allah does not do any injustice to anyone. In Allah la yadlimu mithqala dhurra wa intaku hasanatun yudha'ifha wa yu'ti min ladunhu ajran adhima Allah uh, wrongs not even a weight of atom. Um, and if there is any uh, good done, he doubles it and multiplies it many times and he gave a great reward. Jahannam now, uh, verse 30, Jahannam is going to say, يَوْمَ نَكُولُ لِجَهَنَّمْ هَلِمْ تَلَأْتِ وَتَكُولُ هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ And then the hellfire will call out, Allah will say to the hellfire, sorry, are you filled? And obviously Allah knows everything. And the hellfire will say, is there more to come? This is scary, right? This is very scary. Most time you read this ayah in salah and many people do break down in the process of your thought process when you're standing before Allah reading this ayah. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to go a little quickly because I think the time is almost up. We still have a few more verses. But here, Jahannam will be asked, are you full? And it will say, are there any more? Until the Lord, the blessed and the most honored, puts his foot over it and say, cut, cut, enough. This is it now. And yeah, those are ayat. Now, so what? Then Jannah and the good deeds that leads to it. And this is verses 31 to 35. Anytime Allah talks of hellfire, there's always that balance between hellfire and what is good, what is the better outcome. And paradise will be brought near to the muttaqo, not far off. It will be said, this is what you were promised. It is for those oft returning to Allah in sincere repentance and those who preserve their covenant with Allah, who feared the most beneficent in the ghaib. Remember the same ghaib? And brought a heart turned into repentance to him, absolutely free from every kind of polytheism. Enter you into peace and security. This is a day of eternal life, and they will have all that they desire, and we will have more. So entering, remember, entering into paradise is by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not by the deeds that we perform. Okay, this is a Sahih Bukhari in which Aisha radiallahu anha narrated the Prophet sallam, said, be deliberate in your worship, draw near to Allah and give bad tidings. Verily, none of you will enter paradise because of his good deeds alone. So it's not our deeds on Jannah, it's our deeds on Allah. And I said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah, the Prophet said, not even me, unless Allah grants me mercy from himself. Know that the most beloved deed to Allah is that which is done regularly, even if it is small. So you don't bounce up in Ramadan, and then when Ramadan ends you deflate and you go down until the next ramadan comes up if it is going to come so what are the rewards here jannah will be brought near to the believers to bring east to them so when all of this is going on allah will have jannah come near to the believers they will enter in all peace and security and with honor with respect they will get what was promised to them in the Quran and which they believed in. They believe in all of these things, okay? And they shall abide forever. They will have whatever bounties they have and they will have extra. And that extra is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the most of the Mufatsirin is talking about seeing Allah on the day of judgment. What are the deeds that lead to the paradise? Awab, after repenting. Asking Allah for forgiveness shows your humbleness to ask Allah, that you're not proud that you make a mistake and I, you know, you're too proud to say that I'm sorry, oh Allah. 
forgive me, have mercy on me. Hafiz, you preserve your covenant with Allah. You did not break your covenant with Allah. You know that hadith of Ibn Abbas, that protect Allah, Allah will protect the laws of Allah, Allah will protect you. He fears Allah in secret and with knowledge. So, man khashiya rahmana bil ghaib. Secret, bil ghaib can also mean the unseen. Even he does not see Allah, but he sees the sign of Allah and he fears him. He knows he fears Allah in secret. And he returns to Allah on the day of judgment with a heart turned into repentance to him and absolutely free of shirk. And that's the ayah, wala tamutunna illa wa anta muslimun. Do not die unless you surrender in peace in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that, those are the uh, few thoughts we have. We had to run them through quickly because it was quite a good portion. And I don't think we did justice to any of those verses in terms of in depth. But alhamdulillah, we got some general idea of what Qiyama comes with and uh, the, the, what, you know, the process of it. So now we are opening for questions, inshallah. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman. So we'll open up the Q&A session so participants can submit their questions in writing using the questions tab within the webinar. And I'll, I'll moderate the questions, inshallah. So inshallah, the first question, um, in verse 33, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this term, Talbi um, Munib, um, or a heart returning in repentance, can you describe what are the qualities of such a heart and how do we know whether we have such a heart and if we don't what should we be doing to strive to achieve such a heart mm -hmm. so uh, we will know that we have such a heart if that heart is free from running after ego if that heart is free from running after what people have in their life, if that heart is free from envy when we see people have uh, blessings from Allah, wealth or knowledge or whatever it is, if you know your heart is free from those things, if you, if a brother tells you that, you know, mashallah, I got the promotion today and your heart feels that, uh, oh man, why did he do? Why why is it happening to him and not me? If some you see somebody's house and you feel uh, jealousful, you feel envious of all these. Things, know that your heart is still filled with those um, disturbances. So yes, we can, and this is where the hasibu and fusakum kabla and to hasibu. Omar ibn Khattab will tell the companions. Um, you know, evaluate yourself. And my dear brothers, this is a very wonderful question. But the answer is simple. We need to spend time to evaluate our soul. Too often time we spend time evaluating other people's soul. And once we start doing that and we start putting people down so that we can rise up, we know that we have a lot of work more to do. So going back to Allah in a sincere, uh, pure heart, it calls for doing away with what people have in this life, um, staying away from uh, Riya, show, and making your heart sincerely to repentance to Allah. And that is why in the middle of the night, this prayer or dua that you can do in the middle of the night Min minimum you can do is make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely and say oh Allah I did such and such a thing today forgive me and have mercy on me those are the best moments of repentance uh, the next question um, can you tell us a little bit about the context of this um, surah uh, and is it a makan surah and in which situation was it revealed? Yeah, this Matan surahs generally are uh, surahs that will talk a lot about uh, the Akhira. And uh, Surah Qaf uh, was revealed 
um, in the latter part of the Makan period when uh, the people were denying denying that there is a life after this life as you know that in uh, the Kufar of Quraysh they were asking questions how can Allah bring back the and this is in the beginning of the surah that if we were Torah, we were dust, how can we even come back again? They were denying that the Prophet ﷺ can be from among them someone who will be so upright as to say these things. So all these denials, so after he was giving dawah and all these denials, and so Allah is telling them, this is the reality, this is the reality, this is the reality. And they didn't need too much of tafsir of these ayah because this is their language and this is their they understand what these verses meant and yet they were you know uh, disregarding these verses they were disregarding the dawah of the prophet sallam. and for the believers it was tough for them but allah gives them that um, hope of what qiyama uh, you know what it will be what jannah will be for them and they must work towards that and I think um, in the context here that for believers, if there is one thing in this surah that really is amazing is to see Allah on the day of Qiyamah. And I think this is uh, all of us. It is the greatest ni'mah that Allah will give to any of his creation. That you can see him on the day of Qiyamah and there is no for some scholars they say they do all that they do in this life for that opportunity to see Allah on the day of Qiyamah so this is also brings about the struggles that you go through in your daily life that there is a very very bright end at the at the end of this tunnel that we are going through of trials and tribulation there is that moment and you have to believe in it because these are all ghaib this is all ghaib yeah. um, the next question inshallah is about uh, transgression so we, we studied um, the category of people who are transgressors in, in these verses yes, okay. yes the the person who has this question is asking about the signs of Allah's forgiveness and specifically, if you went to a sheikh at a point in your life that was considered to be like fortune telling, and you regret it so much every single day, and you're sometimes now in a state where you're afraid because you know that Allah doesn't forgive shirk, is that considered to be shirk? Um, especially if it's been now a couple of years and you've stayed away from it. So the person wants to, to, to know, when do they know that they've been forgiven? Yes. Um, first of all, we have to have good, uh, as, the, as the hadith says, think positively of Allah. Allah does not forgive shirk. It is shirk. It is kufr and shirk. But in the lifetime of that person, if he repents sincerely to Allah before the angel of death comes to him, then that is a sincere repentance and he does not go back to that shirk again he feels sorry about it but you can't feel sorry to the point that you feel despondent of the mercy of allah only a disbeliever feels despondent of the mercy of allah and so all of us all of us commit error and sin in our life some big some small or some big and some bigger than that. But so long as we have life, we recognize that there is a wrong I have done, and you repent to Allah. In fact, a lot of the Sahaba, before they became Sahaba, before they became um, leaders of this Muslim Ummah, they in their own life before they became Muslims were filled with these very descriptions that Allah is talking about, they were arrogant, they did not believe in the Akhirah, they denied, they killed, they this, they that, they commit shirk and kufr and this and that. But they accept, at some point they accepted, look at all these people who are taking shahada, they would have done a lot of wrong things. 
So if that brother was still a Muslim and he went to a kahin, a fortune teller, not a sheikh, no sheikh will, this is a fortune teller he went to, then he should um, ask Allah's forgiveness and he should repent on that sin. Maybe he can give some sadaqah as a way of, um, that is some of the things that, that wipe away some sins and make sure that it does not happen again. Jazakallah. Um, just a follow-up question on this topic of transgression. So we know that the greatest type of transgression is when you deny the existence of Allah or you associate partners with Allah. Mm -hmm. Now, within the Muslim community, um, let's say we're not going into that, but what do you think are some of the greatest transgressions that the Muslim community uh, is involved in today? What are the things that we need to be warned about or reminded about uh, so that we can correct our ways? Yeah, most of the things that we transgress about is does we do not see the Quran as the real guide of our life. Quran has not come just to be recited on an occasion or for beautification of someone's voice or upon recital upon one's death. Quran is for the living. It comes to guide us through this life. And I think the Muslim community has more and more gone far away from understanding this Quran, implementing this Quran, and what has happened to the nations before us, as Allah SWT tells us about those nations, that they are like Hemar Yahmelu Asfara, like they are donkeys carrying a weight on their back. So we feel that some other systems are better than this Quran and the guidance of Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. So a lot of times you will hear a lecture from Muslim, you know, whatever name you want to put on them, but PhDs and all the, all the, the title before and after their name, and they will talk for an hour and they will not mention a verse from the Quran or a sunnah from the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. As if this human mind can go and this is what this is what western philosophy has done to us it has made us feel that i i am i can think and therefore i am okay i can think for myself i don't need any guidance to tell me what what to do and what not to do and this is a form of denial you may not accept it, but it is a form of staying away from Kalamullah and Kalam of Prophet ﷺ. And now we are quoting from uh, Ibn Arabi, we are quoting from this one and this one and that one and that big name. And as if these names are now in substitute for what Allah says and what Prophet ﷺ says. And I think we are, we have to get back. We have to get back to the teachings of the Quran and truly the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in a way that it comes to rectify our lives. And once we do that, inshallah, inshallah, we will get back to the izza, but we will lose this izza. What Allah says, Atiyullah wa rasulahu, wa la tanaza'u, fa tafshilu wa tadhaba rihukum, wasbiru in Allah ma'asabri. Obey Allah, obey his messenger. And do not do this argumentation. If not, you will be a loser and your strength will go away from you. We look at the Bilahat and Qurafat in this Muslim Ummah and it is beyond our imagination. Yeah. Okay, inshallah, this will be the last question. And it's on the topic of death of the Shaheed. Um, you mentioned um, a Hadith during the presentation. Would you be yeah. able to cover that Hadith again? And also explain how can somebody get the death of a shaheed? We, we often think of death of a shaheed to be something that's on the battlefield, but there, there's also a hadith that talks about different categories that are likened to shaheed, like dying of plague or drowning or um, cancer. 
Um, yeah. Can, can one strive to get the death of a shaheed? Yeah. Um, the hadith says that uh, a shaheed feels death. That's sakratul maut, that moment of that throes of death, like that of, of how you will feel a pinch, like a little pinch, like, you know, you'll feel that moment it goes. So what we see as people um, uh, look like they're suffering, uh, Allah takes away all that, what we will come consider as physical pain and at the time of death and take it away from them. And so they die in a very happy stage. In fact, there is a hadith that says, everybody who enters Jannah will not want to return back to this world except that of a shaheed and he will come back and he would want to come back and die and die and die again because of the sweetness or the halawa of the face and death. Dying as a shaheed, obviously there are many ways, the best and the most is uh, the one who dies in a battlefield, making Allah's kalam the most high. Um, but people who die from stomach illness and cancer can be one of that. And people who die with building falling down on them and drowning and so forth, or you're fighting off uh, some thief that comes into your house and you're protecting your family and you die in that process. All of that is a shaheed, death of a shaheed. But the shaheed has daraja, and the, the highest daraja is the one who fights in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dies. But it has to be in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't know. I mean, there is another hadith that tells us in Sahih Muslim that the three people that will, three categories of people that will come, the first will be a shaheed. We always say, oh, he's a shaheed, shaheed this, shaheed that, shaheed that. But when he stands in front of Allah, and if there is any, any um, riya, or any show in his death of a shaheed, that act of dying as a shaheed will turn against him and he will be thrown into the fire of hell. And so we should avoid making, uh, being the, the, the one who sanctioned that this is a shaheed and that is a shaheed. Allah SWT knows. And um, we should wish to die as a shaheed in the sense that we, you know, go through any of these process that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has give wahi to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, um, but we must not go this kind of just killing people, killing people, what we are seeing in this world today. That's not uh, shaheed. I mean, you just go and, and kill people unjustly. This is sin. So we have to also remember that a lot of times we get mixed up when people say, oh, they die as a shaheed. They, who say they die as a shaheed? You, if you go and kill innocent people who has not done anything to you, you can't just assume. You cannot just assume, oh, they don't believe in Allah, they should die. Absolutely not. Allah says if he has, if he so desired, he would have created all the man to worship him and to surrender to him. So that concept of shaheed is, is totally out of our understanding as Muslim. And the Prophet وسلم, you know, did not in any way give us any inkling that to die as a shaheed in that way, to go and kill people innocently, is any death of a shaheed. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. So um, with that, we will end today's webinar. Uh, we'll continue the series 9 p.m. Eastern time next week as usual. Um, and with that, we'll end. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh. Awudhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asr. Inna linsana lafi khus. Illa allazina amanu wa amilu sanihat. Wa tawasaw bil haq. Wa tawasaw bil sam. Sadaqallahu nazim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam.